before we uh, enter our next topic. All right. First of all, uh, I've graded Lab 4, but there's a fair number of people that haven't turned in Lab 4 yet. And of the folks that did, uh, there's people that still could use some rework. Uh, and and uh, you know could could afford to rework for credit. Um, the sticking point seems to be um, not catching what happens between 13 through 18, and then again at 19 credit hours. All right, there there has to be a little there has to be catches in your program to catch that sort of thing and deal with it correctly. And even those that I even those I gave full credit for likely could benefit from, in many cases, anyhow, there's a few people that, that did a, a really good job, but um, could benefit from uh, changing it um, and uh, streamlining it a little bit. So I want to talk about that today, all right, streamlining it. In addition, I want to say that I probably will have a short class today to give you folks an opportunity to uh, catch up on stuff to catch up and rework and all that, which I don't mind doing if people take advantage of it, you know. Uh, I'm not doing this for, you know, a, a, an easy lecture day. Um, anyone that knows me knows that I would love to talk, and I'd, I'd have a two-hour lecture if I could, all right. But uh, I do think periodically uh, it, it becomes necessary. And uh, again, I, I think now might be one of those points. So. So we'll have a little bit of a, a, a lecture today to do two things. One is to talk about how we can streamline the code for the tuition calculation. And the second being um, to uh, introduce our next topic, actually, which is a fun one, which is databases. Because this is where we start to really get to the work of this class. Um, consider, up to this point, is getting sufficient background so we can do the real work of the class. The real work of the class, again, the title, Web Database Integration, is creating dynamic pages from databases. All right? In order to do that, you first need to know some of the basics about the, the .NET framework. You sort of have to get up to speed on that. Then, you know, and your coding and all that sort of thing. A little review of databases, I'm sure, would benefit just about everyone. All right? And then we can really get uh, to the, the important work of this class. But first, optimizing the code for the tuition. Let's bring up the tuition chart. And let's see if we notice something. <coughs> Someone turn off the lights? Oh, I would say, that was awesome. I went, and it's like the lights just, just went out. It's like, wow, pretty good. This, again, is, is a case of, how do I want to say this? No one's going to jump out and tell you that this is a way to write this code. All right? No one's going to say, hey, you know, this is what you're going to do, and notice this, and notice that. A user certainly isn't going to tell you. A user simply is going to hand you the chart and might have a couple pieces of explanation about it. But this is where you have to do that sort of pattern recognition and look and understand exactly what's going on to do the calculation. So let's bring up the tuition chart. We can notice a couple things. All right. First of all, if we look and we do the math, we notice that from here to here, it's simply 
an hourly rate. All right. In other words, for Lorain County students, it's one hundred and three dollars five cents. <laughs> what other way they come up with the five cents? You know, what? One hundred three or one hundred four? You know, I don't know. Uh, well, okay. Now we know where the other five cents went. One twenty three ninety five. So I guess that you know the five cents and the ninety five balance out. But the bottom line is it's a flat rate up until twelve. Well, up until yeah twelve or thirteen credit hours, depend how you score it. So in other words, if you want to know what five hours are, you take five times one hundred three and you get five fifteen twenty five. Boom. It's like that for all of them, except there's a different rate, right? So in other words, for an out of county student, it would be five times one hundred twenty three ninety five, and for an out of state student, it would be five times two forty nine sixty five. All right. So from from one to twelve, it's a it's a flat rate, or actually one to thirteen, it's a flat rate. What happens between thirteen and eighteen? At thirteen through eighteen, students are charged the 13-hour credit rate. There's a little note on the bottom. Register for 13 to 18 credit hours and only pay for 13. All right? So there's a different rule for calculating that. All right? It's no longer a flat rate. It's actually 13 through 18, you get charged for 13. All right? Now, that tripped a few people up. Few people, I don't know if they didn't read through the chart the whole way or what, just did the flat rate and, and called it a day. All right. What also tripped people up is what happens again at 19. Because what happens at 19 is not that you're back to an hourly charge. In other words, this is not 19 times the rate. It's actually however many over. Um, it is the 13 rate plus however many over you are from 18. So in other words, 19 credit hours gets charged for 14, right? Because that's one over that 13 plateau. 20 gets charged for 15, right? Because it's two over that 18 cap. And so on down the line. In other words, another way of saying that is... From 19 on, and again, if we were to extend this chart, from 19 on, you get charged for your credit hours minus 5. All right? So, let's look at what we know. What's the basic calculation of credit hours? Or of tuition. It is tuition equals rate times the hours that you're being charged for. All right? So, we have two variables there. How do we come up with those two variables? Well, the rate is a function of the type of student they are, all right, in county, out of county, or out of state. The hours charged is a function of how many hours they're enrolling for, right? If they're enrolling for 1 through 12 hours, the hours charged is whatever hours they've enrolled for. If they're enrolling 13 through 18 credit hours, the hours charged are always 13. If you work, or if you work, if you take more than 18 credit hours, your hours charged are the hours that you're enrolled for minus 5. All right? I didn't deliberately say as a function of, but that's an interesting choice of words, right? When I say is a function of, because we could probably write functions for these things. All right, so I'm going to do this 
just as though it's just one function. I'm not going to write the code because some of you are still working on it, and I don't want to. This, this isn't a spoiler. I don't want to take your fun away from you. All right, so I'll just sort of sketch out the code. All right, then I'll talk about how we could even maybe do a little better on this. All right. Now we could have an if statement that says if residency equals in county. Or we can actually have a series of if statements. If residency equals out of county, if residency equals out of state. And in all these cases, we set the rate equal to something. That's all we have to do, right? Set the rate to something. We can have a similar set of if statements for the hours. If hours are less than 12, then hours charged equals hours. Right? If they, or if they take one of the 12 hours, then there's no conversion done or no no special deal given. You just get charged for every hour that you've taken. If hours are greater than or equal to 12 and hours less than or equal to 18, then hours charged equals 13. Finally, if hours are greater than 18, then hours charged equal hours minus five. Where's that minus five thing come into play? Well, the fact that if you, what does the mi minus five come into? You get an auto credit for five hours or something. Well, no, it, it's, remember, remember what the chart looks like. The chart goes and has a certain rate from 13 through 18 credit hours. Actually, not a certain rate. It has a certain fee for 13 through 18 credit hours, which is the 13. Oh, so you're just paying for one additional. So you're paying for one additional above the 13 eight. rate, oh. not from 18. Right. Wow. And that's what tripped up a lot of people. Yeah. All right. So this is pretty streamlined, right? This has. Determine the rate, determine the hours, do the calculation. This calculation is identical for every situation if you know the number of hours you're getting charged for and you know the rate. A lot of folks had very, very much duplicated code. If in county, then if less than 12 or less than 13, else if between 13 and 18, else if greater than 18. If out of county, if hours are less than 13. Else, if hours are between 13 and 18. Else, if hours are greater than 18. If out of state, and they have that duplicated over and over again, that makes it much more complicated. What if they changed the cutoff and said, you know what, we're not going to give 13 through 18 anymore, we're going to give 13 through 16. All right. If you have three sets of essentially duplicated if statements, you have to change that in three spots. Well, what's going to happen at some point? At some point, you're not going to do it in a consistent manner, and you're going to end up charging <coughs> the wrong amount. All right? Likewise, a lot of folks had the rate repeated over and over and over again. They had, you know, what, what is it for 103.05? times hours, 103.05 times 13, 103.05 times whatever. Well, what if that 103.05 changes? Again, there's three places that you'd have to change it. All right? So think of this and look at your code and see how far you deviate from that. Now, if you want to get fancy, and a couple students did this. David, I think you did this. You broke some of the stuff out into his own function, which is great. Right? Ideally, functions should just do one little bitty thing. All right? It does its job, returns the result, just one and one only thing. 
So I could actually break this out like this. I could have a calc tuition function that gets past a residency status and an hours enrolled as an argument. I could then say rate equals get rate and pass the residency status. Hours equal get build hours times hours enroll. And then finally, return rate times hours. And that could be my whole calculate tuition function. Look how easy that would be to <coughs> test because if I wasn't ready to write the if statements, you know, let's say I, wasn't, I was working on this incrementally and I was doing a bit at a time, I could write my function for get rate 103.05. And I could test my code even before I've had, you know, the details of the function written. In the old days, we called these stub functions, all right? In other words, they, they're sort of like placeholder functions. Were, you know, as, as uh, Tyra says on America's Next Top Model, we're faking it till we make it. All right, so we're faking this function until we actually make the real function. Then we can go in and we can fill in the details and say if residency equals IC, rate equals 103.05, if residency equals OC, if residency equals OS. and then we can return a rate. And then by the same token in our get hours function, get bill hours, we can have our series of if statements if hours less than or equal to 12, if hours enrolled is less than or equal to 12, hours equals hours enrolled, if hours greater than or equal to 12 and hours equal 13 and so on and we can return hours. Breaking it up into functions like this have the advantage that we could potentially use these functions on other pages. All right. In other words, that calculating tuition function was actually doing three things. It was calculating, it was determining the rate, it was determining the number of hours to bill, and then it bill, and then it was calculating the tuition. If we now break it out into separate functions, we could have a page that maybe doesn't want to do the calculation, but maybe just wants to display the rate. All right? Whereas if it's broken down into functions like this, we could make this a public function. All right? And this a public function, and that maybe, maybe not, if we thought it was useful, we could make that a public function. And then other pages could call it and say, just give me the rate for an out-of-county student. And we wouldn't have to do a calculation to get the rate. All right, we could get the rate separate from that. Now, if you take advanced VB or, or advanced C sharp or whatever, you can learn about cool things like enumerations and, and uh, constants and stuff like that. And that, you could work those in here and make this even better still. All right? But simply on a, a function level and on a uh, algorithmic level, this is probably as good as it gets. Right? There's some tweaks you can do to the coding and maybe make the implementation a little bit better. But for just looking on a pseudocode kind of level, 
this is probably as good as we can, we can make this. So, if you have not completed your assignment, keep this in mind. If you have completed it but didn't get full credit and you want to resubmit, keep this in mind. Lastly, even if you did it and got full credit, at least take a look at it and see if this makes sense and how you can change it. Teachers often say among themselves that if you make something optional, students aren't going to do it. Prove, me, prove, prove teachers wrong. Show that we don't know what we're talking about, at least in this case. All right? This is something that isn't required. If you got full credit, you got full credit. You, know, you met the expectations of the assignment. But you know, we don't always just want to meet the expectations. We want to learn how to do this as well as we can. So take the time and, and examine it. Any questions about any of this, by the way? Again, I would maintain, I would argue that there's really no way, well, I, I won't say that. It would be a lot tougher to sort of wing this kind of programming. If you were an experienced programmer, you did a lot of programming, you might look at that chart and instantly know you're going to do it this way. You might, all right? More than likely, though, you'll look at the chart, you'll think about it, you'll look for patterns, you'll try to identify it, and through the process of design, you'll figure out what you could do. Um, gee, I could take that rate, the rate thing and make it its own function, and so on. I guess what I'm saying is the approach of just sitting down and starting coding isn't necessarily going to lend itself to great code. All right? It may get code that works, all right? but it's liable to get code that is very fragile. All right? So we want to elevate that, and we want to take the time and be deliberate about the stuff that we code and, and think through it. <coughs> Questions? I think that's all I had to say about that topic. All right. Which means... Our next topic is our, no, our next topic that's singular is <coughs> databases. I was thinking because databases is plural, but that wasn't the, the noun of that sentence. That was the object, I think. Tell me what you know about databases. Now, the interesting thing is, is I almost am sure I had some of you in database class. But I can't remember who I did and who I didn't. So you're off the hook on that one. Right, I can always blame it on an adjunct or something if you don't remember this stuff. All right. What's a database? What's the big deal about databases? How is it different from other ways of storing data? Someone throws some terms, definitions, descriptions out. Okay. Okay, one statement that was made is it's easily maintainable, and that's true if it's designed properly. All right. It's one of those things like, you know, a coat can keep you warm, but only if you wear it, right? You know, I'll be out somewhere with my daughter and she'll be on cold. It's like, well, why don't you have a coat? Well, I have it, but it's in the car. Well, okay, you know. And it's the same way. Having relational databases doesn't itself guarantee that you're going to have a data structure that's easy to maintain. But it's a tool that more easily allows you to do that. Why is that? Why are databases more easily maintained than other sorts of data. What are other sources of data? Excel yeah, something like an Excel spreadsheet. It could either be literally an Excel spreadsheet or it can be a flat file, which is like an Excel spreadsheet. All right? The reason that databases are more easily maintained is because they do not have redundant data. 
Now, when I say redundant data, I, I mean data that's repeated for no good reason. For example, let's imagine I had um, a worksheet, you know, an Excel worksheet um, about this class and the grades for this class. And I put in there, you know, I, well, no, this class I only have a campus section, but let's say the 216 class. I have an online section and a campus section. All right, let's say I had a spreadsheet for each of them. And for each of them, I had something like this. In each spreadsheet, I had CISS 216, which is web development, which is three credit hours, and has a prerequisite of CISS 121. All right. So I may have my class roster for my campus class and my class roster for my online class. And I may have this on every line of my class roster. All right? That's an example of redundant data because if I repeat that data for each person in the class, it's repeated without really adding any value. All right? Doesn't add value, it's simply repeated. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is potential for inconsistency. If Smith takes CISS 216, the title was web development, CISS 216 doesn't have a different title if Jones is taking the class. It doesn't have a different number of credit hours if Washington's taking the class. And it doesn't have a different prerequisite no matter who's taking the class. All right? In database terms, all right, the way that that would be described is that these things are not attributes of the student. They're attributes of something else. They're attributes of a course entity. Let me give you another example. If I had a roster that had part of it, I'll, I'll kind of go down below here, a student number, a first name, a last name, an email address, a major, and so on. If I had this, a worksheet in Excel like this, if I had a student in two or more classes, all right, I would have their information duplicated in two spreadsheets. So, you change your email address, I update one spreadsheet, don't update the other, again, redundant information, it doesn't add value, and if it's more, and, and, and as was mentioned, it's more difficult to update in this mode, all right, and as a result, um, there's a risk of inconsistency or bad data, all right. The other thing about spreadsheets is typically spreadsheets work for what they were originally intended to do. All right? In other words, you come up with a spreadsheet to do your budget or to do whatever. It works for that specific thing. But to take that same data and present it a different way becomes very difficult with spreadsheets. I'm not saying you can't do it. All right? And again, when I say spreadsheets, I'm not just talking about spreadsheets. I'm talking about any of these flat files. That might be a better way to describe these as flat files. I mean, I wrote programs back in the old days using flat files that took the same data and presented it different ways. But it's not as straightforward of a process. All right? A couple other things to note about relational databases. Databases serve sort of as a foundation of a company's applications and software. You know, what do we know about the foundation? If the foundation isn't strong, nothing's going to be strong. It's easy to change things on the surface, all right? It would be easy to 